Martin Luther. He says, quote, When I was a monk, I thought that I was utterly cast away, if at any time I felt the lust of the flesh, that is to say, if I felt any evil motion, fleshly lust, wrath, hatred, or envy against any brother. I essayed many ways to help to quiet my conscience, but it would not be, for the concupiscence and lust of my flesh did always return, so that I could not rest, but was continually vexed with these thoughts. This or that sin thou hast committed, thou art infected with envy, with impatiency, with other such sins. Therefore thou art entered into this holy order in vain, and all thy good works are unprofitable. But if then I had rightly understood these sentences of Paul, the flesh lusteth contrary to the spirit, and the spirit contrary to the flesh, and these two are one against another, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would do. I would not have so miserably tormented myself, but should have thought and said to myself as now commonly I do, Martin, thou shalt not utterly be without sin, for thou hast flesh, thou hast therefore feel the battle thereof. I remember that Staupitz was wont to say, I have vowed unto God above a thousand times that I would become a better man, but I never performed that which I vowed. Hereafter I will make no such vow, for I have now learned by experience that I am not able to perform it. Unless, therefore, God be favorable and merciful unto me for Christ's sake, I shall not be able, with all my vows and all my good deeds, to stand before him. This of Staupitz's was not only a true, but also a godly and a holy desperation, and this must they all confess, both with mouth and heart who will be saved. For the godly trust not to their own righteousness. They look unto Christ their reconciler, who gave his life for their sins. Moreover, they know that the remnant of sin which is in their flesh is not laid to their charge, but freely pardoned. Notwithstanding, in the mean, while they fight in spirit against the flesh, lest they should fulfill the lusts thereof, and although they feel the flesh to rage and rebel, and themselves also do fall sometimes into sin through infirmity, yet are they not discouraged, nor think, therefore, that their state and kind of life, and the works which are done according to their calling, displease God, but they raise up themselves by faith. Close quote. At about the age of fifty, Tolstoy relates that he began to have moments of perplexity, of what he calls arrest, as if he knew not how to live or what to do. It is obvious that these were moments in which the excitement and interest which our functions naturally bring had ceased. Life had been enchanting. It was now flat sober. More than sober, dead. Things were meaningless, whose meaning had always been self-evident. The questions, why and what next, began to beset him more and more frequently. At first, it seemed as if such questions must be answerable, and as if he could easily find the answers if he would take the time. But as they ever became more urgent, he perceived that it was like those first discomforts of a sick man, to which he pays but little attention till they run into one continuous suffering. And then he realizes that what he took for a passing disorder means the most momentous thing in the world for him means his death. These questions, why, wherefore, what for, found no response. I felt, says Tolstoy, quote, that something had broken within me on which my life had always rested, that I had nothing left to hold on to, and that morally my life had stopped. 
an invincible force impelled me to get rid of my existence in one way or another it cannot be said exactly that i wished to kill myself for the force which drew me away from life was fuller more powerful more general than any mere desire it was a force like my old aspiration to live only it impelled me in the opposite direction it was an aspiration of my whole being to get out of life behold me then a man happy and in good health hiding the rope in order not to hang myself to the rafters of the room where every night i went to sleep alone behold me no longer going shooting lest i should yield to the too easy temptation of putting an end to myself with my gun i did not know what i wanted i was afraid of life i was driven to leave it and in spite of that i still hoped something from it all this took place at a time when so far as all my outer circumstances went i ought to have been completely happy i had a good wife who loved me and whom i loved good children and a large property which was increasing with no pains taken on my part i was more respected by my kinsfolk and acquaintance than i had ever been i was loaded with praise by strangers and without exaggeration i could believe my name already famous moreover i was neither insane nor ill on the contrary i possessed a physical and mental strength which i have rarely met in persons of my age i could mow as well as the peasants i could work with my brain eight hours uninterruptedly and feel no bad effects and yet i could give no reasonable meaning to any actions of my life and i was surprised that i had not understood this from the very beginning my state of mind was as if some wicked and stupid jest was being played upon me by someone one can live only so long as one is intoxicated drunk with life but when one grows sober one cannot fail to see that it is all a stupid cheat what is truest about it is that there is nothing even funny or silly in it it is cruel and stupid purely and simply the oriental fable of the traveller surprised in the desert by a wild beast is very old seeking to save himself from the fierce animal the traveller jumps into a well with no water in it but at the bottom of this well he sees a dragon waiting with open mouth to devour him and the unhappy man not daring to go out lest he should be the prey of the beast not daring to jump to the bottom lest he should be devoured by the dragon clings to the branches of a wild bush which grows out of one of the cracks of the well his hands weaken and he feels that he must soon give way to certain fate but still he clings and sees two mice one white the other black evenly moving round the bush to which he hangs and gnawing off its roots the traveller sees this and knows that he must inevitably perish but while thus hanging he looks about him and finds on the leaves of the bush some drops of honey these he reaches with his tongue and licks them off with rapture thus i hang upon the boughs of life knowing that the inevitable dragon of death is waiting ready to tear me and i cannot comprehend why i am thus made a martyr i try to suck the honey which formerly consoled me but the honey pleases me no longer and day and night the white mouse and the black mouse gnaw the branch to which i cling i can see but one thing the inevitable dragon and the mice i cannot turn my gaze away from them this is no fable but the literal incontestable truth which every one may understand what will be the outcome of what i do today of what i shall do tomorrow what will be the outcome of all my life why should i live why should i do anything is there in life any purpose which the inevitable death which awaits me does not undo and destroy 
these questions are the simplest in the world from the stupid child to the wisest old man they are in the soul of every human being without an answer to them it is impossible as i experienced for life to go on but perhaps i often said to myself there may be something i have failed to notice or to comprehend it is not possible that this condition of despair should be natural to mankind and i sought for an explanation in all the branches of knowledge acquired by men i questioned painfully and protractedly and with no idle curiosity i sought not with indolence but laboriously and obstinately for days and nights together i sought like a man who is lost and seeks to save himself and i found nothing i became convinced moreover that all those who before me had sought for an answer in the sciences have also found nothing and not only this but that they have recognized that the very thing which was leading me to despair the meaningless absurdity of life is the only incontestable knowledge accessible to man Close quote. to prove this point tolstoy quotes the buddha solomon and schopenhauer and he finds only four ways in which men of his own class and society are accustomed to meet the situation either mere animal blindness sucking the honey without seeing the dragon or the mice and from such a way he says i can learn nothing after what i now know or reflective epicureanism snatching what it can while the day lasts which is only a more deliberate sort of stupefaction than the first or manly suicide or seeing the mice and dragon and yet weakly and plaintively clinging to the bush of life suicide was naturally the consistent course dictated by the logical intellect yet says tolstoy quote, whilst my intellect was working something else in me was working too and kept me from the deed a consciousness of life as i might call it which was like a force that obliged my mind to fix itself in another direction and draw me out of my situation of despair during the whole course of this year when i almost unceasingly kept asking myself how to end the business whether by the rope or by the bullet during all that time alongside of all those movements of my ideas and observations my heart kept languishing with another pining emotion i can call this by no other name than that of a thirst for god this craving for god had nothing to do with the movement of my ideas in fact it was the direct contrary of that movement but it came from my heart it was like a feeling of dread that made me seem like an orphan and isolated in the midst of all these things that were so foreign and this feeling of dread was mitigated by the hope of finding the assistance of someone Close quote. that spiritual genius molinos the founder of quietism quote, when thou fallest into a fault in what matter soever it be do not trouble nor afflict thyself for it for they are effects of our frail nature stained by original sin the common enemy will make thee believe as soon as thou fallest into any fault that thou walkest in error and therefore art out of god and his favor and herewith would he make thee distrust of the divine grace telling thee of thy misery and making a giant of it and putting it into thy head that every day thy soul grows worse instead of better whilst it so often repeats these failings o blessed soul open thine eyes and shut the gate against these diabolical suggestions knowing thy misery and trusting in the mercy divine would not he be a mere fool who running at tournament with others and falling in the best of the career 
should lie weeping on the ground and afflicting himself with discourses upon his fall man they would tell him lose no time get up and take the course again for he that rises again quickly and continues his race is as if he had never fallen if thou seest thyself fallen once and a thousand times thou oughtest to make use of the remedy which i have given thee that is a loving confidence in the divine mercy these are the weapons with which thou must fight and conquer cowardice and vain thoughts this is the means thou oughtest to use not to lose time not to disturb thyself and reap no good Close quote. 